We have a family service with the kids, so I'm going to be competing with Hajun today, and Ian maybe. So it's okay. We'll, I'll just talk over them. But uh, please don't be distracted. Maybe we're going to have to pay extra careful attention. Amen? Now, I yell, so it should be pretty easy, but uh, please, I hope you're not annoyed by children. Th those are joyful sounds. Amen? Praise the Lord. I'll, I'll, I'll read. I'll read too. I'll read. Okay, uh, the title of today's sermon, it is Children of God. Can we turn to our neighbors and say, we are children of God? Amen. If, if, if there's a brother next to you, say, you're, a, you're the son of the Most High. And if we're, if we're a sister, you're a daughter of the Most High. And one more time, you're, we're the bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. That's who we are. That's our identity. Amen? So you cannot find your identity in anything else besides this. We are the bride of Christ. We are the children of God. Amen? We're okay. We're safe when we understand this, when we stay right here. Hallelujah. And I want to talk about true spiritual family. Okay? And these, come, uh, these words come uh, straight from Jesus. Okay? So it's important for us to pay attention. Now, I'm going to read from... Where am I going to read from? Okay, Matthew chapter 10, verses 21, 22, and then 34 to 39. And I'm also going to read from Matthew uh, 12, 46 through 50. I'm also going to read a lot today. That, that isn't up there. I'm just going to bombard you with Scripture. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay, let's read. A brother... Okay, let me, let me give you a little bit of context, actually. Okay, so Jesus is talking to his disciples about the end times. Okay? the destruction of the world right before Jesus returns. And so he's giving a warning. He's also encouraging them, telling them in advance what's going to happen so they're not totally surprised. He's saying this is going to come upon the world. This suffering will come to your doorstep. But fear not, for I am with you and I've told you in advance. I am in control of human history. So don't be afraid. But rather be prepared. Okay? That's the message. And he's saying, Brother will betray brother to death, and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. I also want to read, before we go to um, the Matthew 12, I want to just reinforce it with uh, passages in Luke. So Luke chapter 21, verse, verse 11, and then 16 through 17. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, and sisters, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. And then we'll go now to the Matthew 12. Okay. While Jesus was still talking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside wanting to speak to him. Someone told him, your mother and brothers are standing outside wanting to speak to you. He replied to them, who is my mother? And who are my brothers? Pointing to his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of God for the people of God. Okay, so two main points today. I want to uh, focus in on this uh, last passage. It's a story 
you know, where, where Jesus is teaching his disciples and the crowds are gathered around him. And at some point, his mother Mary and his brothers, they go to take charge of him. In the Gospel of Mark, we have a parallel account and they think he's crazy. So they're going to take charge of him to bring him home because he's bringing danger to himself. He might be killed. Now, this is very interesting because this is the same Mary who was visited by the angel before she gave birth. And the angel told her, you will have child and he shall be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And she knew she didn't have relations with Joseph, but she knew that she had conceived. She's okay. This is from God. I am carrying the Messiah. She knew it. She was told it. When she went into the temple, Simeon, he took the baby and he confirmed it. God made it absolutely clear to her that her son Jesus was the Messiah, was the Son of God. And there's a story of when he was young. I think he was like uh, maybe 12 years old and he's, uh, he's at the temple area because his, his parents, they're, they're faithful Jews and they go up to Jerusalem for the festival. And so they went from Bethlehem to, to Jerusalem and after the festival was over, they're heading back home. And along the way, G uh, Jesus is lost, right? And so they go, Mary goes back to the temple area. And then she finds Jesus at the temple speaking with lawyers, right? The teachers of the law, the, the scribes, the Pharisees. And everyone is amazed at his level of understanding. He's asking tough questions and he's fielding tough ones and giving good answers. And so his mother Mary goes to him and says, Jesus, my son, what is wrong with you? What's your problem? Don't you know that your father and I, we were so worried, we were looking for you. And Jesus, he doesn't say what most kids would say. Like if it, if, if it was me, I'd, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, or okay, okay, you know? But Jesus says, why were you looking for me? Didn't you know? I had to be in my father's house. So it must have been a shock to her, but you know, it reminded her that Jesus is not an ordinary man. He's fully man, but he's fully God. He's different. And so I'm sure even raising him, there must have been many times where she saw, okay, this is, this is God. This is something different about my son. And she knew it. But when he's doing his earthly ministry, now things are beginning to get really weird. Right? Maybe it's more than she had imagined. And in this story, we find her taking her other sons and let's go take charge of your older brother Jesus because he's out of his mind. And the crowd there, when they find out that it's his mother and his brothers, see, that, that's, that's the key that opens the door, right? Because there's no other way they could get through the crowds. Everyone was mesmerized by Jesus. But when you say, your mama's here, it's like parting the Red Sea, right? Shh. It's your mom. Because the Jews are all about family. All about family. Honor your parents. For this is the first commandment with a blessing. If you want to live a long, prosperous life on the earth, you have to honor your parents. So they're trained from early on. Honor your parents. Love your parents. Respect your parents. And so the people, they expect, okay, Jesus is going to honor his mother. And Jesus says, who's my mother? Whoosh! What an embarrassment to Mary. What a shock to Mary, to the people, even to the disciples. Whoa, who is my mother? That was shocking. And who are my brothers? And then he points to his disciples sitting at his feet. He says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, he is my mother and brother and sisters. What is Jesus saying? 
Because that doesn't make sense, first of all. He has his genders mixed up. He is my mother. That doesn't make sense, Lord. But what Jesus is saying is this. Earthly families are good. And we first learn about the love of God through our parents. Okay? The family unit is good. But Jesus is saying that there's something more important. That there is a spiritual family that supersedes the natural family. That's what he's saying. And he is my mother and he is my sister. You see, we don't have the language to define the spiritual reality, the spiritual family that we are a part of. It's so much more. It's so much greater. That's what Jesus is teaching. And so, I think it's very important for us to understand this. That this is what Jesus taught. Okay? I want to just give you uh, more scripture. Okay? And so it's a lot, but please just listen. Amen? Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. That sounds like a nice family. Amen? That's a spiritual family. Hebrews 2, 10 through 12. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. John 1, 19, 9 through 13. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Ephesians 4, 3-6 Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Just two more. Galatians 3, 26 through 29. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The last one, Ephesians 2, 14 through 20. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. There's more, but I want to spare you. But I think it's clear that we are the family of God, that the purpose for Jesus coming into this world, it was to create a new humanity, a new family that is joined together, that is no longer divided by hostility, by regulations, by commands, by kosher. But rather, we're one now. There's one Lord. 
One body. We worship by one spirit. The one Father. Jesus came to create a new family. That's what scripture says. Amen? Now, I know that here in Korea, like, <clears throat> there are very deep uh, roots in Confucianism. Right? So like, you, like the five relationships and it's like, it's all about the blood, right? Pichul. Right? And I think that's a part of the reason why uh, adoption doesn't really work so well within Korean society because it, it, it's not my blood. And so I think Koreans understand this very clearly that the family unit, it's very tight-knit. You honor your parents, right? It's very Confucian, right? And so we have to learn, unlearn, and, and, and relearn just like the disciples had to. You know, I'm kind of guilty of this too, actually, because my family is really close. You know, I, my family is close, you know? And like, I thank God for that. You know, like, I FaceTime my parents every day. They live in America every day. You know, my sister and I, we were so close. Like, when I went to college, and we were just so close. People thought we dated. We <laughs> were so close. You know, it's weird, huh? But we were so close. And so, you know, th through the years, I, I kind of just had my own private time with my family. My family was the sacred cow, right? Don't touch, you don't touch my family, okay? I love people. <laughs> I love God, love people, and then I'll go home, right? <laughs> and then that's like my family. But God has been trying to teach me, no, that's wrong. They're your family, your immediate family, your blood family in a very special way, but there is another family. It's called the family of God. We all share the blood of Christ. We all share the DNA of God. We're born of God's spirit. New natures, new creations. And God is always reminding me, David, 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 look at the church. That is your true family. And I think it's important for us to understand this and begin to see one another through this lens. Because I think we're all kind of guilty of it, right? We have our family, and then you have the church family. This is like the side family. This is the Sunday family. Friday, maybe Saturdays. But this is my true family. But the Bible is saying, no, we have it mixed up. The church of God is our true family. Our identity is wrapped up in Christ more than anyone else. And that's why Jesus says that we must hate our fathers and hate our mothers and hate our brothers and sisters. See, if you just take a very simplistic look at the Bible, it, it sounds like he's contradicting himself. It sounds ridiculous, right? He says, love your family, honor your parents, and then hate your fat father. What does that mean? Now, what I think he means is this. Your devotion to Christ has to be so, so firm that it, it trumps all other devotions, even to your parents. So let me just give you an example, all right? So I love my family. I love my family. My family loves me. They've been asking me like six and a half years, when are you coming back? 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 Okay, they bought a brand new house in Atlanta, and they got a car, a nice car. Like, when are you coming back? The car's yours. When are you coming back? You know what I'm saying? They're trying to entice me, and I'm like the only son in the family. So you know, if I guess in Korean culture, I'm supposed to take care of my parents. They're getting older. They're like seventy something years old. You know, my dad has like two heart surgeries. My mom had breast cancer, and you know they're getting old. And I should be there taking care of them. But I'm here in Korea, and I'm taking care of God's church and my family. And so when people look at me, and they look at my family situation, they might say, you're, you're a bad son. Your parents are getting older. You know, my sister has never touched our kids. 
ever. Why do you do this to your family? Your parents have asked you repeatedly to return. Why are you still in Korea? Bad son, bad son. See, it might look like hatred, but I don't hate them. I love them. I love them, truly. But my love for Christ is greater. And I'm here because the Lord has asked me to be here. He didn't command me, all right? He asked me to be here. And I joyfully said, yes, Lord, I will. Is that what you want? Okay, is, is that clear? I think, I think that's what the Bible is teaching, all right? Our devotion to Christ has to be greater than anything else. And I think we need to begin to unlearn what our paradigm is about family, true family. Now, see, I, I don't enjoy being like a doomsday preacher. I don't. You know, it might look like I do, but I don't. You know? But when I look at the Bible, these are the areas in which God speaks to me. Because we just have to be prepared. It's better to be safe than sorry. Amen? And maybe I'm, I'm, I praise God that He made me the way I am. Because I don't really care what people think of me. I don't. I care about speaking the word of God in love, pleasing God, and loving you in the best way by presenting the truth to you without any filters. Now, the Bible clearly says, Jesus clearly says that at the end of time, there will be great persecutions. And you may feel like you're so close to your family members. You may feel like you have a best friend who will never leave you. But Jesus says, no, the testing will become so severe and people will become so afraid that a father will betray his child to death. A brother will betray a brother, a mother her daughter. Jesus says, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have come to bring a sword. I've come to turn a brother from a brother, a father from a child. See, that's like a part of the Bible we, we just want to maybe ignore, maybe kind of erase and just focus on the peaceful, the good, the, the nice, the safe aspects of Scripture. But no, we have to take this at face value. And what Jesus is saying is this, that in the end, there will be testing for everybody. So let's get this out of our minds. I, I do this too sometimes, okay? Sometimes we think, okay, these allusions to suffering, they don't apply to me. Tell them, you might suffer. <laughs> Becky, I don't get, I don't, you other Christians might suffer this, but not me. Somehow I'm going to... I'm going to avoid this somehow. That's not true. The Bible clearly says, Jesus clearly says, everyone will be salted with fire. Everyone will be tested. Everyone will be purified through suffering and persecution. Everyone's heart and mind and their devotion to Christ, their faith will be revealed for what it is. Everybody. And so I think it's the wise thing and the loving thing to be prepared. Amen? Now, I know this might be a little sensitive and I want to try to navigate this as, as gently as possible. Now, I know that most of us are Christians here, but maybe we have a family member who's not a Christian. A father, a mother, a brother, or sister. Maybe we have very close friends who aren't Christians. And we might be so close now, and it may appear that there is such a strong bond between us. But Jesus clearly says that in the end, you will betray one another to death. A father betraying his child to death, I mean, that, as a father, that seems just like, what are you talking about, Jesus? That's so out there. But he's right. 
It's going to happen. And so, in the time of the end, in order to be prepared for this, we must find our security and our identity in, in being the body of Christ. Amen? We have to understand that we have a true spiritual family. People who might not be of the same natural blood, but spiritually, we are of the same blood. We are of the same spirit. And in the end, when that testing comes, it's not your unbelieving mom or dad or sister who's going to stand by your side and encourage you and comfort you. They're actually going to betray you and hand you over to death. It's the Christian in here who's going to stand by you and pray with you and encourage you and hide you. That's reality. And we need to be prepared for this because it's going to come sooner than later. You know, I grew up in L.A. and, you know, you guys know, some of you know, you know, I, I grew up kind of in, in bad circles for a part of my life. And there was a close group of friends. There were seven of us. We we're so, so close. Like nothing could tear us apart. I loved them more than I loved my parents. We hung out every day. We did bad things together every day. So close. So close. When, you, when you're partners in crime, you get so close to each other. You got to trust each other. You spend time with each other. There was that real bond. And uh, one day, uh, just something happened. They did, they did something, and they got caught. And so they all went to prison, right? So they all got taken to, you know, to the police station and... Now the cops, they were offering deals. Who did it? If you tell me who did it, then you'll get off. And the person you pin it on will do the time. And I'm telling you, we were closer than close. And here's an even funny thing. We all went to church together. So we were close. But one guy ratted on the three other guys and he got off scotch-free he left and the other three ended up doing time and one of the guys he did 25 years and when his brother found out that that guy had ratted on his younger brother and he was going 25 years he put out a contract for that guy's life he hired a hitman to kill him and we were close! We were church people! And there, I could have never imagined that that would happen, that we'd be broken up like this. But it happened. You know why? Not because they hated each other. They loved each other. But the thing is, you always love yourself more. That's the truth. When you're afraid, you're looking out for yourself. And that's what Jesus is saying in the end. Your parents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, they're going to hand you over, not because they really hate you. It's because they love themselves more. And I can imagine a situation in which there is a family divided. Some belong to Christ and some don't. And when the persecution comes, the unbelieving parent can look at the child and say, what is wrong with you? Obey your parents. Why are you bringing this suffering on our family? Why are you bringing the heat here? What is wrong with you? Why do you live the way you do? For who? For this God that I cannot see. Why do you subject yourself to this? Is it worth it? They're going to mock you and ridicule you. They're not going to understand you. Just like Mary didn't understand her own son. Your parents won't understand you. Your friends, your brothers and sisters, they will not understand you. Don't look to them. They will betray you. They will betray you. Believe the word of Christ. That will happen. I'm going to 
I'm going to kind of transition. It's related. And again, I, I want to say this very clearly, um, as gently as I can. I've been wanting to say this for a long time, actually. But today's the day. Um, I know a lot of sisters in the church are just ready to get married. You know, you've been ready. You were ready five years ago. You are ready ten years ago. You're still ready. But, and I'm not knocking the guys, but there, there's just like a lack of guys in the church. And that's true for Korea. That's true for America. It's, it's kind of true all over the place, I guess, right? But I think it's especially true for Korea. Now, I'm sure there are many reasons why I'm not going to give you the full list, but um, I think guys, I, I'm speaking to the sisters now, okay? I think guys feel a lot of pressure, right? Because especially here in Korea, you got you to gotta go to college, and then you go to military service, and you come out, and, and you have like 25 years or 30, whatever, to, to make money, to save money. And in the meantime, provide for your family. And then when you're about 55, they're going to can you because you're too old. But Koreans are going to live to like 100 years old now in the future. So what are you going to do for 45 years? Can you save up enough in 25 years to sustain you in 45 years and your entire family? You see, there's just a lot of burden on the man. You have to have a house. You got to have a good job. You got to have this and that in order to be a good man, fit for marriage. And so a lot of brothers just check out. A lot of brothers, I talk, they just say, oh, you know what? If that's the case, I'm just not going to get married. You understand that, sisters? That there are brothers who think it's just better not to get married. I would rather not have to work for my family. I just want to live for myself. That, that's too much of a burden. That's a part of the reason why it's harder to find men. And if that's the case, then there's just a shortage of guys. That's just the truth. And I don't have to tell you that. You, you know. You're the one who's waiting. You know better than I do. And. I pray for you guys, and I ask my wife, she'll vouch for me. I pray for you, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm con not concerned, but I feel for the sisters. Like, you know, just like, who, who could I connect, connect, set up with? Who could I? We're ta we talk about these things, but we want to be wise about it. We want to see everyone get married and, and, and have a happy family. And I, we want this, and I want this. Okay? And if you're praying for this and, and you're believing for it, praise the Lord, I'm believing with you. And I'm praying with you. Amen? And I will be so happy for you when it happens. But if, but if it doesn't happen, I'm not going to be sorry for you. Yeah, is that clear? I'm not going to be sorry for you. I'm going to still rejoice with you. See, it, it, uh, I think what I really want to say is this. Probably not everyone's going to get married. And that's just uh, the reality on the ground. And so I pray that everyone does get married. Whoever wants to get married gets married. And, but I'm just saying you have to prepare yourself uh, for a life of singleness. And I want to say that's okay. It's a good thing. Now, I want to go to the Bible, okay, to because it doesn't really matter what I think. It matters what the Bible says. Now, marriage is good. Don't get me wrong. Marriage is good. Amen? Did anyone come to my marriage, my, my wedding? Who was there? A lot of you. Do you guys remember the sermon? Of course you don't. I remember it. And it was wonderful. He said this. When God created the world, he made everything good. It was perfect. But he looked at the world, and he looked at the man he had made, and he said, 
Something is missing though. The man needs a helper. It's not good for the man to be alone. And then God created Eve, and now the world was perfect. Marriage as an institution was the crowning piece of God's creation. So the Bible affirms marriage, hallelujah. And I think the whole point of being married, it's not so much to get into a small family cell and just go off by yourself and have your private life. That's not what marriage is about. Marriage is from God and marriage is supposed to be to God. And so in marriage, what I find is that when I married my wife, I took on the identity of Jesus Christ. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved it. Okay, I see. How did he love the church? He died for the church. He fed the church. He washed the church. He comforted the church. He discipled his church. Okay, so that's what I try to do with my wife. So I take on that identity and I begin to understand how Christ loves me and his church. When I became a father, I took on the identity of the father. I began to understand the father heart of God, to be kind and patient and gentle and to give and to adjust to my kids. See, the whole point of marriage, I believe, is to know God better to become more like God by taking on his identities, to grow in love and to grow in character, to become like God and to experience life as he does. I think that's the point of marriage. So it's good, amen? Now on this side, okay, and I think I'm qualified to speak of this because I was single for 11 years. I didn't go on one date for 11 years, all right? So I understand you, I do, right? This life of singlehood is great also, is great also. The Bible says so. In the New Testament, what Paul says is this, it is better not to get married. It's better not to get married. Because if you're single, you can be devoted to the Lord completely in your mind and in your heart and in your body. But a married man is divided. I'm the, you see, I'm divided. I attend to the Lord, worship, but my, my, my wife and my kids, I have to, I got to attend to this too. You see, I'm divided. My wife is divided. But when you're single, and Paul was really addressing uh, specifically women, and saying a, a woman, a sister who is unmarried can be devoted to the Lord, can offer her entire body to the Lord in worship, to be intimate with God. And he's saying it is better not to be married than to be married. Okay, so... It's a tie, okay? It's a tie. Scripture validates, it affirms both as being good because you don't get married just to go off in a small cell. The point of marriage is to know God and draw close to God, become intimate with God. And the point of singlehood is not to become a recluse in my time and you're on a planet called me. No, your singlehood is meant for the Lord. So you can be devoted to the Lord at all times. Is this clear? Now, with that being said, I know it's hard. And we can say, yeah, that makes sense. And I, yeah, I get it. But it's still not easy here. And I get it. I get it. And I think the first thing we need to do is uh, throw out the, the lie throughout the paradigm that if if you don't get married something's wrong with you you know like those uh, like advertisements on the subway duo duo kyoronu dochi mara right don't miss out don't and so like the message is if you don't get married you're missing out 
and you're a loser, and you're, your whole life your mom's gonna <laughs> trying to kick you out of the house. Where is she going? And to the sons, which Hanganga, what's wrong with you? And your friends, what's wrong with you? And people rumor, oh, she's that old and she's not married. There must be something wrong with her. And he's wrong, he's that, there must be something wrong with him. And there are these rumors and this paradigm, and that's all wrong. It's wrong. Jesus was never married. Hallelujah. <laughs> Paul was never married, according to Scripture. Do you know anyone more blessed than Jesus and Paul? Anyone? Okay. So we need to throw out this idea that we lack something or something's wrong with us if we don't get married. One is not better than the other. They're both great. Amen? Because it is through both that we can draw near to God and become more like God. That, that's the point. All right? Now, uh, but still that doesn't solve the problem. They're just, I'm so lonely. <laughs> and they're suffering. I get it. I get it. And it's just that, it's just there. It's just, and, and, and for like six years I just played it. Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm busy serving the Lord. I'm okay. It'll happen when it happens. If it happens, okay. And if I don't get married by the time I'm 50, then I'll just be celibate. Whatever. You know it, but it was just kind of like, it wasn't the truth. I was suffering. There was pain. There was loneliness in my life. So I get that. But I, I think the key today and moving into the future is this. For brothers and sisters. We are relational creatures. God has built us for relationship to give love, receive love, to be in fellowship. And that's a good thing. And so we have built into us longings for intimacy. We just have to be satisfied. There are these longings for intimacy. And for the brothers, that's why a lot of brothers, they watch pornography. I'm serious. Because deep down, there is a longing for intimacy. Both men and women have that. But if we're moving into a future where not all of us are going to get married, and even if you do get married, you might not have children, are you as a Christian going to still believe that there is something wrong with me because I'm not married and I'm somehow barren and because I'm cursed and uh, there's something wrong with me because I don't have children? No. The way to satisfy that longing for intimacy now and in the future is this. You got to get it from God. You got to get it from the Lord. And you're going to get it through His church. Like what I read in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 47. Let's read it one more time. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That's weird. Bank. Do you think we could come together and say, let's share bank accounts? This is another level. I don't even share bank accounts with my parents. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet to every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts to worship, to pray. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That sounds like a healthy family. And there were widows there. There were single people there. There were married people there. But this was the family of God. And all of their longings for intimacy were satisfied in the church through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. They weren't focused on themselves. They were focused on God. And this is not a picture of people who are lonely, who are disillusioned, who are upset and resentful. It's the picture of bliss. And I believe that as Christians, both now and in the future, we're going to have to learn to love each other 
and to satisfy each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And if you don't have children, it's okay. You can be parents to our kids. You're going to have spiritual children, disciples that you're going to nurture and love and rear in the church of God. See, that's important. I believe that in this time, the Holy Spirit is trying to get our focus on the body. Because in the end, I can't look to a non-believing brother or sister or mother or father to care for my kids and to even watch my back. I need to look to the church. I need to be able to trust you. And that's just reality so what's the what, what, what's the key here I'll close with this first your identity has to be found in being a child of God okay that is who you are you're a child of God we are brothers and sisters in the Lord we are the bride of Christ your true brother is not your brother at home with the same last name. Your brother is the brother who loves your heavenly father the way you do, who does the will of your father from his heart. That is your brother. My brother and my sister, my true brother, my true sister, is not simply the person with the same last name. It's the person who loves my father the way I do. The person who loves my bridegroom, Jesus, the way I do. So don't call me brother. Don't brother brother me unless you do the will of my father and you're loving Jesus. You're not my brother. You're not my sister. If you don't love our father and our brother, Jesus, our friend, the same way. And I think that's the understanding we need to have here in this church and in the worldwide church. There's an eternal family, a spiritual family that is real, that is everlasting. My wife will be my sister in heaven. My kids will be my sisters in heaven. My parents will be my brother and sister in heaven. You see, these earthly definitions, they don't translate. What's true is Jesus says, you're my friend, you're my brother, and you're my sister, and you're my bride. And that's who we are. We need to begin to see ourselves in that lens and to see one another in the same way. And I pray that we can begin to live it out step by step. Here, even in our church community, I pray that we can draw closer to each other. That we wouldn't be a group of people who just, just come and go and have superficial relationships. I pray that we can be a, a body of people who, who come and stay. And if you have to go, praise the Lord. But during your time here, we, we are having true koinonia. We're truly blessing and supporting and loving one another, building each other up. I pray that you will come for more than just the praise or the sermons or for Bible study. I pray that you would not just come and date us, for a, a, a free dinner. But I pray that we can be a family and be married to have a, such a, a tight bond in the Lord that supersedes everything else, that we would encourage each other in this nation, in our homes and workplaces and schools to really, and we know that we have a true family the family of God. My last uh, 
pastoral advice is this. I pray we can all avoid this situation where families are divided. Because it's a very painful, it's a very sad situation. And the only way to avoid that in the future is to rectify it today. Please pray and reach out. Love your non-believing family members and friends today. And not just simply believing in a superficial way, but I mean having that deep intimacy with Jesus. To be devoted to Christ like the five wise virgins who took extra oil, burning through the night, worshiping through the night. I'm talking about that type of relationship with God. Please be the agent for that. Because if that doesn't happen in their lives before the coming of Christ, this picture will play out in those relationships. And I don't want that for anybody. I don't want that for myself. I don't want it for you. I don't want to see you with blood on your hands. I don't want to see myself with blood on my hands. Because everyone will have to give an answer. Everyone will be salted with fire. Let's be prepared. Amen. Let's truly, let's be a family in the Lord. Let's live out who we truly are. Let's not try to become what we already are. Let's just, let's be who we are. That's what I'm saying. Amen. Can we turn to our brother and sister? You're my sister, my true sister. You're my true brother. And that's why I, I, I like to do the Lord's Prayer and just look at each other all awkwardly. Do you know what I'm saying? To, to really see who's here. You guys want to do it? Let's just do it. How about let's do it? Can we get into a, a big circle? Let's do the Lord's Prayer together. How's that? 